Well, I was given two different titles to speak to, and I only came across the second one quite late. So, uh, <laughs> righto. <laughs> Can I take this off? No, maybe not. I've been given two titles to talk to during the time, and uh, the second one I think is probably the most, uh, most relevant one. Talking about what, uh, what conflicts of interest I have is, I was once told that I'm highly conflicted. I think it just means that there's a long list of things we, where I've uh, had money from doing various things as a consultant. I hope it doesn't mean that I'm truly biased. There are various, various types of carbohydrate scores that have gone through uh, the literature, and you will have uh, come across most of these, I'm quite sure. Generally speaking, uh, when we're talking to uh, members of the public, we tend to use uh, these, these qualities with it, with it take high fiber, uh, the uh, high cereal fiber, lower sugar load, lower added sugar load, and so on. And also, when it comes to foods, uh, then we have uh, all these with, with the ticks, and we, we're all generally satisfied with that. But the literature has more than these. What about starch to sugar ratio? Well, for people who uh, think that GI is an important quality, then it's rather difficult to specify that as a quality item, because starches have different GIs. When it comes to starch cereal fiber ratio, it gets even more difficult because starch has different GIs and the different types of, of, of uh, dietary fibers. When it comes to total carbohydrates, we've got the same sort of problems. A ketogenic one, well, the question is, if we're talking about the population as a whole, um, is it sustainable from an agricultural point of view? Uh, I think not. When the lower starch load has also appeared in, in the literature, um, as, as an idea, um, but again, it's not optimal, probably amongst those who, cons who believe that GI is important. And we can actually go along this and say that whatever it is, uh, we, we, we pinpoint, uh, we can say it's not optimal, there's always something else. And that's true because there is always something else besides carbohydrate in the diet. What should we do about the glycemic index? Well, we have two figures here. What, if you were going to say, what would you say? Well, it's not optimal or this optimal? Well, I think it's really basically not non-optimal. So we can't really just say that um, there is a, there's such a thing as a glycemic dietary pattern. Not in use that, because other things are important too. Well, when it comes to food, uh, then here we have from um, sugar if I can get his, na his name right, um, Shriggles Ring Shuttle. Would, what, do you do, what would you say? Anyone know it differently? Would anyone know it differently, Shriggles Ring Shuttle? Spring Shuttle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Almost. Well, I'm learning every day. There are qu quite a number of things here at the top where we have these marks next to them where we know that sugar-sweetened beverages uh, we don't recommend. And generally speaking... There's an increase in belief that if, if the lower, uh, if, sorry, if the, um, if the risk, risk ratio or, or the, um, yeah, the, well, I'll say if the, if the risk ratio is, is greater than 1.2, then we tend to take some note, some consideration uh, in, pu in public health, or if it's less than 0.883. Um, and we've given other definitions, additional definitions for defining these things that that it's got to be greater than a lower 95% confidence interval, greater than a 95 confidence interval uh, for that going up and that one going down, down to 0.91. And those, those two are, are of equivalent strength. We get the same thing here for red meats, that um, these, these go through these thresholds of interest for public, for public health. <coughs> well, we often give dietary recommendations uh, in terms of five, eat five a day or give advice about these various uh, food groups. And what would we say about that? Well, it's not optimal. Why is it not optimal? Well, for those who believe in the GI, then we know that for all these different food groups, there's a whole range of GI values. If you, if you take away the mean differences between these, so adjusted to all the mean, the similar mean, 
for all of them. And there's, a whole, there's still a whole range of values. So you can take up diets of different GI values, which is 35%, use this, and you can still apply GI. That's not to say that that will improve matters for you, but, but we can say that um, it does look that it's not optimal. Now, I'm going to say something about prospective um, cohort studies. Thinking now about uh, type 2 diabetes and glycemic index, there are quite a number of meta-analyses uh, in, in, the, in the press. And what we can say is that this one here, um, this is the sort of range of values that these meta-analyses have given, but that doesn't tell us anything about whether this value is higher or lower than 1.2. Now that's for GI, and we get the same thing if we go on for glycemic load. A glycemic load, same, same things. We can't tell whether it's greater than 1.2 or not. And part of the problem here is, is, is choosing, uh, the, the, choosing the studies uh, so that you've got what we think are, are the valid studies. And one of the valid validation, important points in validation of a study is the validity of the food frequency questionnaire that is used. Uh, and we've used the validity uh, cutoff point of it's got to be greater than 0.55. Now, when we do this, of course, what we find. Oh, I'll skip that. What we, when we do that, then we find that with the high quality studies on that definition, they give quite a high. Uh, a reasonably high uh, relative risk, whereas if we take out the low quality studies, uh, then they don't. So we can just keep an eye really on the on the high quality studies, and this is quite quite a legitimate thing to do um, when you're when you're doing uh, meta analysis. If you define first of all what is going to be uh, your your inclusion criteria. When we do this, um, we can look at the impact of the glycemic index for type 2 diabetes across the whole range of values in, in amongst these studies. So normally it's about 10 units for within, within, within a 10 units of, of glycemic index on the glucose scale within a population. On average it's that. But if you take all the studies uh, and do what I call um, a global dose response meta-analysis, then you can you can get uh, quite high numbers. It goes up quite high numbers. Here's the the range of, of values uh, down here up to 2.2, but uh, but it also, it's also dependent on the method of analysis that you use, and the cubic spline model is generally preferred. Again, with these criteria, we have these figures here: 1.27 I mentioned earlier and the 1.87 for, for, this, for this relationship when it's converted to the relative risk. So that's really quite a strong relationship in, amongst nutritional uh, studies. The same for glycemic load, almost identical. Same criteria, almost identical results. Some people believe this is identical because what we're really doing is with glycemic load is we're accounting for glycemic index. And some people think that sometimes it, it includes carbohydrate as well. Um, that's not well worked out yet. Um, if we look now at for coronary heart disease the glycemic index using the same tools, then that goes up to uh, all the various, various values here. In the middle you can see the sort of mean cubic spline relation in the first set of confidence intervals is the one that you get um, out of the uh, Greenland and Lonica approach to doing this sort of thing. Um, but it, it does involve predicting where these other studies are. And so there's an additional error which is due to prediction. If you've got a lot of studies in this area here as well, then you'd expect those to be quite narrow. So where are we now with the, num with the numbers on that? These criteria again, 1.24 for 10 units, and going across the globe from 48 to 76 units, and it's now 2.71 for the uh, glycemic index. 
So that last one is really quite strong. Hopefully we've got something coming in now for glycemic load. Now it's very strong. Um, it predicts a movement up, up here and potentially as high as six. But if it were log linear, it would be up as, as high as high as three. So you can't always, it's, it's model dependent is it, on how you analyze these data. So you can't be too specific about these things. But um, it is, in both cases, whether it's type 2 diabetes or, or, uh, or coronary heart disease, glycemic index or glycemic load, with high quality studies, then there's quite a, uh, an influence. This is looking at uh, now a meta-analysis of carbohydrate in prospective cohort studies. So we're looking at what is the impact of, of the amount of carbohydrate, which um, so the relative risk per 98 grams of carbohydrate per day. 98 grams was uh, the range of values from the lowest to highest uh, uh, with, with, on average within, within these studies. So uh, that's, not, that, that's not a predefined value, that comes out of the data. And what we're finding is that when the glycemic index is, is quite low, there's not a very uh, large effect of, of the carbohydrate quantity, but when you get up to a higher glycemic index, then the carbohydrate quantity has a very large effect. So this is, again, an extremely good, uh, good, good figure. It would, would tell you that, that it's a strong response. Well, what about, well, before I go on, yes, again, population studies, uh, this is from um, Salmeron on, in, in, in women, I think, I think it was, uh, showing that it matters to what the dietary fiber content is, but in this case, it was cereal fiber and glycemic load. They were particularly interested in glycemic load, but at the time, not glycemic index. And so it was both fiber and glycemic index which was an important quality. And I think that is, is really quite a, a landmark paper because um, on, in, on intervention studies, we could in, in look at a number of in meta-analyses of intervention studies and we could uh, predict what the, fasting blood, what the changing fasting blood glucose would be on moving on to a, a low glycemic load diet from a, from a high glycemic load diet. And again, uh, there it was, the quality was related to glycemic load and the dietary fiber on fasting, on fasting glucose. And you get the same thing now if you change your fasting blood glucose to the change in the fructosamine level. Now these are studies of up to three months duration. That's why fructosamine is the, is the glycated protein of interest. And you can go on. Now on to glycemic index again, both are important quality items for the fasting glucose. And the fructosamine in the same studies up to three months. So we, it's very difficult to talk about quality and only use dietary fiber without glycemic index. And it would be inappropriate to, to talk about glycemic index without talking about dietary fiber. And in the equations I put up, they had severity of, of, of the dysglycemia. These individuals, let me point out now, were from 4 millimolar up to 14 millimolar, so these are normal levels of blood glucose up to prediabetes and diabetic or diabetes patients. And what we notice is that the magnitude of the effect of the low glycemic index was this glycemic index, yes, glycemic index diet. Uh, low to high, or high to low, really, in this case, uh, the size of the effect that you get uh, is, is dependent on the severity of, of, of the disease. But note, it, it goes all the way back to uh, the population normal. Since that study has been done, and quite a number of other uh, publications have appeared, and some will recognize Sachs in there for the DASH study. He had a nice paper, which looked like a nice paper, in, in BMJ and, and British Medical Journal, which I think is this one. Um, and he made quite a thing about, well, doesn't glycemic index actually push the, push the value up of blood glucose? But really, it's, it's only about the noise that's there. And the interesting thing about this, these intervention studies is that if you just put these through, uh, through uh, uh, a forest plot, then you probably say nothing happens. 
but when you put it through some meta regression, you can see that it behaved, we get the same thing as before, that it moves towards, towards normal values. We're not expecting any changes. Uh, it may even be uh, protective for too low values, which might not be uh, a, big, a big effect, but um, we have to consider that in, in future. General practice studies are quite important too for diabetes. Now we're getting away from members of the public, um, but general practice studies are really dealing with people with pre-diabetes and diabetes. So you're not feeling well, you go to uh, the GP, your general practitioner, uh, and tell him all your woes about uh, your condition. And he design, he diagnoses type two diabetes and what to do in that circumstance. Well, I can tell you about some of the things that are going on um, within the UK. We have two recognized approaches now, um, one through the National Health Service, and one through the Royal College of General Practitioners. This is the direct study which I presume most of the people know about. But the important thing to do is to know is that this is where uh, the patient with type 2 diabetes is given a calorie restricted diet to create weight loss uh, and then eventually to go on to a calorie restricted food diet um, of lower GI and GL. And the remission by year one is, 50, is 46%. This one is developed by David Unwin, who is a low carbohydrate man, but he uh, Im implicated a high GI restricted regular food diet, uh, aiming to lower carbohydrate. So he got the lower carbohydrate by restricting the high GI carbohydrate foods. And at 2.2 years, he had 50% remission. And I can tell you that all his patients uh, seem to like the type of diet. But it's, not, it's about the message as well. And here's the message that he gives. Really, glycemic index, serving size. comes Now, normally we, we'd say glycemic load down here, but he expressed it not as glycemic load, but the equivalent uh, glycemic response to different teaspoons of, of, of sugar. And that really has caught on amongst the patients, and it becomes an important message. Scientifically, it, we don't like it necessarily, it's important. Weight loss, the same with the direct study, with the direct study as in, in, in the uh, as in the Unwin studies. Similar weight loss, similar remission. Uh, my conclusions are, are very brief in, in, in some ways. There is sufficient evidence from prospective cohort studies, intervention studies, and general practice for GI and GL to be taken to for GI and GL to be taken seriously as markers of food quality, influencing public health in respect to T2D, CHD, and and their development. When I say take, take seriously, I don't mean seriously. GI and GL doesn't work, and we should take that seriously. I think I'm thinking the other way about. As with all such mar markers, more research can be done in research practices, maybe sometimes because we enjoy research and, and its pay. Well, members of the population go without this dietary choice, and it's about choice. When the general practitioners have decided what they're going to do with their low-carbohydrate diet based on removal of, of high GI carbohydrate foods, what they did was say that it's got to be about choice for the patient. Do you want a, a drug-based approach or a dietary therapy-based approach? So that's important. But also, long-term general practice results are needed for follow-ups beyond two years, and I know one that's coming out before long, on the therapy of type 2 diabetes, especially to ensure plant-based sources of protein and lipids are eaten and, and that monitoring is, is, is undertaken. I'm not going to say any more than that, except that I think I did say uh, in the vote that I must be one of the only one or two people saying that a low GI, uh, sorry, a low carbohydrate diet could be recommended, but only to those who want, to, want that choice, and only if we consider the quality of the carbohydrate. Thank you very much.